continue. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Associate Professor Leonie lockstone Binney. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our session for the JHTM Symposium. Uh, and today we'll be talking about what is and how to judge uh, research originality. Uh, we're very privileged today to have the uh, perspectives on offer from uh, three uh, very senior editors-in-chief of leading journals within the tourism field. And they'll be sharing their insights in relation to this topic. So I'll introduce each of them in turn. Uh, and when I finish that introduction, I'll then lead off just on the blurb and about what the session today is about. Uh, and I'll give my panelists a couple of questions to frame their initial introduction to the topic. Then we'll open up for a, a more broader Q&A session. So if you do have any questions that you'd like to put to our senior editors, please do put them in the Q&A function or in the chat and we'll be monitoring those. So we'll get underway. Um, firstly, I'll introduce my first speaker. Uh, Professor Sara Dolnika uh, is a research professor at the University of Queensland. Uh, Sarah has degrees in business and psychology. Uh, she's best known for her work improving market segmentation, uh, and she's also an expert in Airbnb. Uh, currently, Sarah has a very uh, large grant, which is investigating ways uh, to test experimentally uh, how consumers can behave in a more environmentally friendly manner on a voluntary basis. Sarah has published uh, more than 300 articles. Uh, and in her capacity today, she's here to talk to us as our co-editor-in-chief of the Annals of Tourism Research. So welcome to Sarah. Our next speaker is Professor Kathy uh, Su from Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, Kathy is chair of um, a chair professor of hospitality and tourism marketing at uh, Hong Kong PolyU. Kathy is also currently editor, editor of Chief of Tourism Management, having taken that role over a few years ago. Uh, and previous to that, she was editor in chief of the Journal of Teaching in Travel and Tourism for 16 years. So a significant track record in editing our leading tourism journals. Kathy's focus is on tourism behaviors, emotions, resident sentiment, and also stereotypes. Uh, she has won various awards, uh, including the John Wiley and Sons Lifetime Research Achievement Award. Uh, and she's also a fellow of the International Academy for the Study of Tourism, as is Sarah. So thank you and welcome, Kathy. Our final speaker today is uh, Professor Mariana Sagala. Um, Mariana has just very recently uh, left us here in Australia and has moved uh, back to her homeland of Greece uh, to take up the role of Professor of Marketing. Uh, and Mariana, if you'd like to introduce your university name, just so I don't get that incorrect, <laughs> incorrectly <laughs> pronounced. <laughs> uh, university of Piraeus. Perfect. Thank you. No uh, so prior to that, Mariana was here with us in Australia uh, and was Professor uh, of Tourism at the University of South Australia and Director of the Centre for Tourism and Leisure Management. Uh, her credentials are combined with a significant professional experience in the tourism industry. Uh, her areas of research expertise relate to services and experience management, uh, information and communication technologies, uh, and also wine tourism, which is a great topic. And I know she's uh, run various conferences in relation to this. Uh, she has published nine books and numerous papers in academic journals uh, and presentations at various international conferences. Uh, she is past uh, president of Eurocree and also a past member of the uh, executive board of a number of other tourism associations. Currently, uh, she is serving as editor of chief of the Cowfield uh, journal of tourism, sorry, hospitality and tourism management, uh, which is the leading uh, journal for um, tourism and hospitality in um, Australia. 
and she has been awarded the prestigious Eurocree President's Award for her lifetime contributions to tourism research. So welcome to all of our panellists and I should have briefly introduced myself as well. Uh, my, myself, I am Professor, Associate Professor, I should say, Leonie Lockstambini. I won't give myself a promotion right at this point in time. I'm an Associate Professor and a Research Director at Griffith University uh, um, and I have a background and expertise in relation to volunteering, um, specifically in the settings of um, tourism and also events uh, and have published significantly in that area. So I'm very pleased to welcome all of our speakers today and get underway in relation to our topic. Uh, so today we're looking at a very uh, important topic in relation to uh, academic uh, knowledge and the generation of knowledge within the tourism field. I'm sure as you've all experienced, as I have, um, if you've ever received a paper rejection, which might have said, oh, we love your paper, but it's not original enough. It doesn't make it an original contribution to knowledge. Uh, now, that is often quite a contested uh, outcome. And this is really what we're talking about today and getting to the heart of what is original knowledge uh, in the tourism field. So our panel will be speaking in turn initially about this topic uh, and we'll be trying to find some common ground about what it does mean uh, to produce original research within the tourism field. So we, we broadly understand that originality is uh, about producing something new or something novel, uh, but it does still remain a very subjective uh, um, topic and very contested. So our panel will be speaking to us today about how they view uh, originality and how they apply it in relation to their journals. Some of the criteria they use to assess uh, originality when they receive uh, paper submissions. Uh, and they'll also be talking to us about some of the challenges of assessing originality uh, in the tourism field. So without further ado, I'll hand firstly over to Sarah and she'll give us her initial views uh, and then we'll go from there. So thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Leonie, and thank you for the invitation. I'm super excited because this is truly challenging. We get asked often to go on panels like this and to talk about, I don't know, rigorous methodology or all these kinds of things, but this is a really difficult topic. So I struggled. I don't have like a pre-canned answer to all your questions. So I'll share a few thoughts with you today, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that will develop after that. So first of all, I did want to say, I think there's kind of two types of originality or lack thereof. One I will call baseline originality, and one I will call mind-blowingly awesome originality, right? And they're very, very different things. So baseline originality, we actually have quite a bit of problem with baseline originality, and that comes to the point of plagiarism. And plagiarism is not just taking and stealing someone else's or your own text from a previous publication, but it's also, you know, uh, generously borrowing other people's ideas. So first of all, I want to get that out of the way. That is, it remains a big problem. A year ago, about a third of the papers I saw come through my desk at Annals would get straight desk rejects because of plagiarism. That's a, a, a crazy high amount of plagiarism. And I, it's much more difficult to assess the borrowing of ideas than the borrowing of text. So first, you know, that's kind of the baseline. If you can't create a work that is genuinely your own, then we don't even have to think about your uh, uh, originality of thought. Um, now, the mind-blowingly awesome originality, that's the thing I'm actually really excited about. I really am because, and I think all the editors share that. We all want to publish the coolest, most interesting, most novel, most inspiring work. But actually, we don't very often see that, right? So what is this mind-blowingly awesome originality? It's about coming up with something totally new, right? It's connecting dots that nobody else has connected. And that's extremely difficult, because if you say, how do I assess it? Or how would I advise an author to do that? It's just, there's no formula for it. In fact, you know, I would argue that some proportion of it is how people's brains are wired. I think some people's brains are just wired in a crazy way and they connect dots differently. But we can learn it. We can train ourselves. And I have a few ideas of how we might be able to do that. So it doesn't come naturally to most of us. 
I need people to know it causes a lot of difficulties in the review process. Like if you are going to actually have something really super original, the review process really struggles with that kind of work. The review process is very comfortable to assess marginal originality, right? It's just new enough to pass the originality test but it's just old enough so that the reviewers don't get terrified and they don't lose their framework of how to assess uh, a contribution. Originality is exceptionally hard to engineer and it's exceptionally hard to learn. And that comes at a time when our young, I shouldn't say young, our early career researchers are actually in a terrible, terrible time to start their academic careers because uh, the, the predominance of metrics encourages them to engineer everything, right? And I would argue that tendency is reducing the originality of our work overall, uh, because en engineering originality is just not possible. All right, I've got another minute. So here's a few thoughts I had. And again, they're not pre-canned. I just had to come up with them because uh, Leone asked me to. So how can you uh, do original, or how can you keep yourself honest, let's say in terms of originality? I can't tell you how to do it, but I can tell you what not to do. And I actually think that goes 80% towards maybe giving advice on that matter. First of all, don't use a publication formula. You're gonna say, well, what's a publication formula? I can tell you if you're in the editor seats, you can you see it, it, see it all the time. It's almost like, like someone has some, some template booklet and some authors just work it off the template. And, you know, it's not original. It's just another study following the same formula. So that is not originality. Don't adopt approaches that are well-established just because they're well-established, right? Another thing, we do that to minimize risk of being rejected. But in fact, it's the clearest path to non-originality, right? If you just keep doing what everyone's been doing, uh, that's uh, almost certainly not going to create original work. Don't take a question that's been investigated a million times and then add the tiniest little twist, right? And say, well, that's original. You see that little corner, it's definitely original. Yeah, That's not what I mean by mind-blowingly awesome originality. It's just an interpretation uh, variation on the theme. And maybe the most fundamental thought I have around this is that you need to always question everything. Yeah? So a prerequisite for originality is independence of thought. So if you are not thinking independently in every aspect of your research, it's impossible ever to create anything original. Then you're just kind of reproducing in different flavors what, uh, what knowledge creation in your field is already about. So. Uh, Followers are rarely pioneers. So if you want to be original, you've just got to get out there, be courageous, and uh, actually take some risks in the publishing um, uh, space. That's it from me, Leone. Thank you, Sarah, for that very, very comprehensive introduction. And I think there's some brilliant points there that we'll, we'll certainly pick up on uh, in our um, facilitated Q&A after that. And, and I think some very thought-provoking things that our audience can be mulling on uh, in the interim uh, in, in relation to, um, uh, I think, baseline originality versus mind-blowing originality. And as you suggest, it's very difficult to engineer mind-blowing <laughs> originality. But uh, it would now be great to hear Cathy's thoughts in relation to the topic. Uh, and we'll see if there's any commonalities or any differences in relation to uh, the thoughts of our speakers as we progress. Thank you, Cathy. All right, thank you. I absolutely agree with Sarah in terms of the, the big original ideas. It is difficult to come by, isn't it? If we're just, uh, everybody tells you you need to do a literature review to see what has happened. But sometimes the literature review, if you go too deep, that kind of narrow your frame of thought, right? Uh, the, the question that always come from uh, junior faculty or our graduate student is, Everybody has done everything else. What else can I do, right? So that if you're once in you, you're in that um, frame of mind, it is really difficult to break through. Um, very often, we were asked about the question, where did you come up with the idea? What's the aha moment? And everybody has a different aha moment. Um, I, I think just a, um, a couple months ago, we had a faculty retreat, and then 
a couple of us were asked that question, and surprisingly, one question, uh, one person answered the aha moment come from when I was shopping, and the other person said the aha moment comes when I was changing the diaper of my son. So really, um, you really need to be observant. Uh, ask the question why um, or what, right? Uh, so what kind of world do, do I want to, to, to leave to my son? Therefore, the person came up with a, a, a whole series of research ideas. Uh, shopping, why am I treated this way as a tourist or why am I treated this way as a resident? That could be a, a uh, topic eventually. So I guess be observant of the environment. I mean, tourism is an applied field. So everywhere we go, there are opportunities for innovative research. Um, it's, we just need to open our senses to see, to smell, to, to think, the most important thing. Uh, don't just look at it, but, but think, how can we make this better? How to, can we make the interaction better? How can we make the tourist experience better? How can we make the resident's life better? And all of these questions will help us come up with a creative idea that no one has looked at. It is important to look at the theor theoretical literature. Yes, it is. But that aha moment usually come <clears throat> before you do the literature review. Once you have that question in your mind, uh, you've been very curious and you have that question in your mind, then you go back to the literature and see if there is any theoretical support that you can, uh, can help you solve the problem. Um, so I, I think that comes later, right? Um, in the old days, uh, some people say we lost that um, opportunity to discover now because everything is keyword search. You, want, you know what you want to search, therefore you only get to see what you want to see. Whereas in the old days, you go into the library, go through the books, go through the index card, if any of you remember that, and very often you will find something you were not looking for, and that gives you that aha moment. Well, this is something really interesting, and I can do something about it. So don't just do the keyword search. Sometimes um, on the trinet, editor will send out a table of contents. Just go through the table of contents. Maybe you look at what other people have done, and then you were like, no, I can do better, or I can do something different. I disagree with this approach. I can use another approach. So uh, not so. What is novel? What is original? Not necessarily the topic. Topic, obviously, if you come up with that uh, particular topic that no, nobody else has looked at before, great. But there are other ways to be innovative. For example, uh, one phenomenon, somebody explained it in what, that way, but then you say, no, I disagree. I can do a better job or I can provide a different perspective using a different theoretical background or theoretical uh, perspective. So that will be another way to do it, right? Um, and another thing uh, from the editor's perspective is that we don't have expertise in every subject area. So if you submit something, for example, in econ econometrics, which is not my area, I don't even understand it, right? Uh, but you need to tell a good story. You need to tell me why it is innovative. What is your contribution? How is it different from all the thousands of papers that have published before? And if I believe in your story, then I will let the reviewers to be the judge of whether this is really something original. So you need to pass the desk review. And desk review usually uh, done by a group of editors. So you need to tell a good story so that editors will think, hmm, there is something there, right? So very often when we look at the manuscript, if I see a light bulb, then I will send it out to the next editor to take another look or send out to the reviewer to let them judge the, the rigor and then the, uh, the, the true originality in that particular subject area. So I'll stop here for that. Thanks, Kathy. Um, uh, I think there's some great points there about um, potentially being more reflective. Uh, and it's always that um, struggle to find thinking time uh, as opposed to busy time when we're all you know, working very, very hard. But yes, taking advantage of some of those um, times to be more observant and potentially creating those aha moments. Um, I think that's an excellent insight. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on now to our final panellist, uh, Mariana, who will share her ideas on this topic. And I think we're starting to see some of these commonalities come out. 
Um, uh, following Marianne, I'm going to put one initial uh, question to the panel uh, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. So over to you, Mariana. Thank you very much, Leonie, and um, welcome from me as well. Uh, before I start, I would also like to uh, just mention that Leonie had been an associate editor for the Journal of Hospitality and Tourist Management. So you also have some experience on that or you have been judging papers for originality. Um, and uh, feel free to interpret or intervene and moderate the discussion as you feel appropriate as well. Uh, my suggestions or perspectives as an editor, um, trying to judge originality as well. Um, originality or innovation, words like this, they're very subjective in the way people understand them and how they evaluate them. Um, but what is certain is that everybody, I think, agrees that originality means or uh, to give an example, relates to inventing a wheel. Well, to be realistic, we do not have enough scholars to invent a wheel every day, so we publish very good original articles in all the journals we have. So um, if we strictly interpret originality, that we only publish papers, that they invent the wheel, we are not going to succeed in having enough papers. So in my interpretation, there are different sages or degrees of originality, or the way that we perceive them or we define them, um, which is not bad because producing something original, it doesn't always necessarily mean that you have to investigate a new field, a new concept, a new theory. Um, equally, an original study can see an existing theory from a totally different perspective and reveal a new dimension, reveal a new variable, reveal or show us that we haven't probably understood the whole concept previously. Um, how can somebody probably do this? Or what can enable us to see the same things differently or from with different eyes? Somebody can think of probably uh, using a new theory, a new approach, a new discipline, um, a new perspective, a new stakeholder to share his or her view about a known phenomenon. Some other people I've seen, they have used new data sets, new methodologies to try to investigate deeper from a different angle and come up to a solution. Now, be careful when you do this because sometimes when people, for example, try to replicate or transfer one theory or one perspective from one discipline to another, they fall into a trap. And the trap is that they, in some way, um, get into to what Sarah said before, plagiarism. Uh, they borrow ideas, they borrow methodologies, they borrow, I don't know, concepts from a different co context. They probably might not even sufficiently or effectively justify why this theory can be applicable to tourism or hospitality or they don't relate to what has previously been discussed in the tourism and hospitality field. And then they come up with solutions or things that they, they don't make any sense, or they simply replicate something from one field or discipline to our field. Now, is that original enough? Some journals might say yes. Some others, they might say no. And this is where, as I said before, we have totally different interpretations of originality, different degrees. And um, some people, they also get unhappy when their paper is rejected from one paper, from one journal, then they resubmit to another journal and their paper is accepted. And then their hard feelings and their negative feelings, why this person has been nasty to me or why another person and another journal editor has been more flexible or more accommodating. Um, now, another trap that some people get into it 
And I think we really need to try to avoid it. For some people, proving originality has become a gap spotting exercise. What do I mean by this? They identify a gap and then they say, okay, I have a gap, I will go and do the study and I have an original paper. Well, before you do this, have you questioned yourself? Why somebody, for example, hasn't tested this theory or answer this question in this context? Does it make sense? Is it valuable? Is it useful? Do we need to know? Because if it's not useful or appropriate, then why should you bother? Um, does it solve a problem? Um, so by simply stating that there is a gap, we haven't examined this question in this country, in this context, we haven't tested this theory in a new sample, it doesn't mean that you're going to produce an original research as well. You might, you might not, yeah? But simply stating there is a gap, it doesn't justify anything. Um, and to a certain extent, sometimes it creates another problem. Um, if you try to prove a gap in some way, you try to reinforce or improvise our existing mental thinking or our existing way of thinking. Um, what do we really need to do if we really want to invent a will, if we can manage to do it, is to try to get more inspired, not recycle or go around the same things again and again and again. Um, we don't want in some way to try to find a consensus. Yeah, one author said X, another author said Y, let's investigate what is in the middle or what is a consensus. Sometimes we have to sift the consensus. We have to shake um, our perspectives. We have to challenge them. We have to uh, question whether the assumptions that we have made are correct or not. So um, as I said before, I'm not going to give you solutions how to become original, but hopefully by saying what not to do, uh, I have tried to, to give directions in terms of uh, how we can invent a wheel, probably even the same wheel, but probably in a different way. Uh, so I will stop here and I will welcome any questions or anything that can challenge me as well. Mm. Or trigger my imagination. <laughs> Thanks, Marianne. And I think that's the easiest starting point is to talk about and think about what is not original uh, research. And yes, from my own perspective of being an associated ed editor in so many papers, you see, oh, there's no research on this. Uh, so therefore, oh, I've done my study. There's no research. That's my contribution. Uh, whereas it's not the questioning of, well, why is this research important? Um, has this been identified in the literature as being an area where there is research required and needed to really um, to generate new knowledge? So the, the actual fact that there is no research on a topic is, as you say, Mariana, not necessarily sufficient justification uh, for, uh, for a research study. As I said, I'm just going to put one uh, initial uh, uh, question to the panel, and I think um, it's probably um, related to um, some of the points that our panelists have already uh, touched on, uh, and particularly uh, in relation to assessing that more um, uh, mind-blowing uh, research uh, continuum, so not the baseline, uh, where it might be a little bit more easier for reviewers to assess, but uh, particularly the mind-blowing originality for our panellists. Um, do you see there being any biases from reviewers in assessing those type of mind-blowing uh, papers? Um, you know, does it present challenges for reviewers if it is something that is not necessarily uh, um, the norm or um, typical of what uh, you see in uh, the tourism discipline? So I'll open that up to our panel. If anyone wants to go first, Mariana, Kathy, or um, Sarah, are there are there biases from our reviewers in assessing original research? Uh, okay, I'll start. Oh, Sarah wants to start. 
No, no, I don't mind. Maybe Leona, you just need to give a name, then we don't have to be sure. polite. Ariana, yes, you yeah. know, thank you. Give thank a you. name so we don't. Okay, yeah. I'll be very directive from this point on. Yes. <laughs> okay, Sarah, please. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, I think I've already raised that. I think absolutely there are biases, but they're not by. When we say bias, we have this idea of a really malicious reviewer sitting in their office and trying to deliberately influence the journal process. That's not how it works, right? We're all humans. So you think about reviewers just like you who have a certain history of what they've done over their life, what they've read over their life. So they then get a paper that's just totally out of the box and they have a semi-panic attack, right? Because it's breaking all the boundaries. It's not following the procedure of how to measure stuff. It's not developing hypotheses and they're overwhelmed. And their human reaction is to go, no way. I, I can't be responsible for something crazy being published in such a high profile journal, right? So, so absolutely, if you're gonna create really highly original work, expect to have a lot more hurdles in the publication process. That's just the reality of it, yeah? But then the other part of the question is, do you, should that be stopping you? And my response to that comes from the heart and it says, no way, right? I mean, we are researchers because we're curious about stuff, not because we wanna increase our age indices, right? Or satisfy our university's publications quotas. So you can't give up, you've gotta pursue your passions and you've gotta take the freedom to have out of the spare ideas, but you need to walk in with open eyes and knowing that it will be more challenging for the review process to handle it. And I think us as, re, as uh, editors who are sitting here, it is our role to ensure, to kind of mitigate that process, to, to maybe you know, help those totally out of the squares papers that struggle through a routine review process. Mm. Uh, Mariana and Kathy, did you have any follow-up questions uh, or comments, I should say? Well, as Sarah said, there is always bias. Even artificial intelligence that is based on mathematics has bias. Yeah? yeah. Um, what we are trying to do as journal editors is to try to eliminate the type to error, meaning somebody rejecting a paper that on the basis that there is no originality, although there is. Yeah? So, um, we do try to, of course, read through the reviews, try to understand why somebody disagrees, if he or she disagrees, yeah? If there is uh, a positive and a negative, we always go to a third reviewer um, or even a fourth, uh, because the more biases, the less unbiased in some way you might have, yeah? You need more eyes to cross check and see uh, whether people agree or disagree. Um, we also try to include reviewers that they come from totally different perspectives, perspective, disciplines, uh, theories, um, methodologies, you name it. And the reason that we try to do this is because we try to avoid the plagiarism issue. Nobody can know everything. Nobody can be expert even on his or her own field or to be to have read everything that it has been published. Um, so there might be cases whereby somebody is plagiarizing in inverted commas, a theory from a different discipline that the reviewers have never read, not to their fault, but because there is too many to read, you know? And at the end, the paper might get published. I've seen that several times. So the more we use reviewers that they come from different disciplines, the more we avoid this kind of type of two error, let's say. Um, there was something else that um, um, it was in my mind um, in terms of how do we inspire people to become creative? Because nobody or not every one of us can be as creative as it should be. Well, talk to other people. Yeah, synergize. And the fault that sometimes we all do is we try to produce a paper by starting at the end. We want originality or we, I want to produce a paper. I want to prove this. 
Well, don't start from the outcome. To reach the outcome, you have to go through a whole process and you might not even have an outcome at the end. So try to ask the right question, um, try to know how to do research and be assured that if you know how to ask questions and how to answer them, you will definitely get to the outcome. I think sometimes we try to do it the other way around and that's wrong. <laughs> Thanks, Mariana. Uh, Kathy, did you want to chime in just in relation to any biases that you've seen uh, in the process? Yeah, just, just a couple of points to supplement. Um, it, it, it will be really, well, as an editor, I usually try to find reviewers who can look at the, the paper from different perspectives. So if it's completely new, for example, the methodology is uh, established, but the concept is new, um, then I may have somebody to look at the big picture and another reviewer to look at a specific methodology. So different people can look at different pieces of the work um, not necessarily they have to understand everything. Um, so, so that helps. Very often I rely on, for example, an editorial board member to tell me overall, take a step back, look at the big picture, is this a good idea? And then somebody else can look at the specifics. So uh, we can borrow reviewers uh, to, to pitch in to, to look at a different aspect of a particular paper. And um, very often when I see something that I thought, oh, that's really cool. I may give the authors the benefit of the doubt. For example, three reviewers, two came back negative and one came back mm, potential. Then I may give the, the authors another chance to help me to convince the reviewers that this is a good idea, right? Um, so again, you, you need to tell a good story for the editor and for the reviewer to see why you need to do this, why is this a good idea and why, you know, so tell a good story. And that really helps, it helps the reviewer, helps the editor and, and help the authors as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kathy. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A uh, from Anita and it touches on um, just something Marianne has mentioned uh, and uh, also Sarah, um, Anita asks, uh, Sarah has mentioned in her opinion that some people's uh, brains are wired to create mind-blowing originality. Uh, what suggestions can be given to those people who don't find this a natural, um, a natural thing that comes to them? Um, so how can they uh, succeed to be more creative and um, get to the point of uh, mind-blowing originality? Uh, so uh, Mariana, you touched on that, but Sarah, if you could just pick up on that point as well. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, first of all, there's nothing to regret, right? There's very few people uh, in the history of humankind who are wired like that. So it's not like every second one's wired like that. You know, you've got to be an Albert Einstein to be wired like that. So it's nothing to regret. But I think we just need to be quite aware. And we've heard that from all of the editors today. The worst thing you can do if you're not wired, if you're wired like that, it's your natural mode of operation. Right? You almost can't help yourself but be original. So then what you have to worry about, and you can see that in the history of science, is that all the people with revolutionary ideas have trouble convincing uh, uh, their peers. So, uh, but if you're not wired like that, which is most of us, you can prevent the trap of copying other people's work, other people's approach, other people's methodology. And that is very tempting because we read a lot. So we kind of assume that what we read is the state of the art, bees, knees, original research. But actually it's not, right? I mean, so you, everyone on this panel knows me quite well. So I have a certain pet code hate, which is about the use of five and seven point ordinal scales, right? I have ample evidence that that is the possibly worst answer format you could use in a questionnaire. I've been convincing or I've been communicating that for a good 15 years, and I'm just not getting traction. Even in my own journal, I'm not getting traction with it. Right. So, but why do we do it? Well, because the entire history of social science is using five and seven point scale. So a new researcher looks at this and says, well, surely if we've been doing it for 50 years, it's got to be the best thing to do. Yeah. So if you want to break the cycle, you must look in the engine room. You must st stop just accepting that something that's state of the art is actually the best possible solution or the best possible methodology. You've just gotta be independent in your thinking. And that's something we can learn. 
So we don't have to be wired like that, but we can rewire ourselves to not follow the highway, but branch off into the little alleys and find exciting stuff, find better methods, do things our way. It's the harder path, but it's a very rewarding path. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so Mariana touched on uh, working with other people. So um, potentially, if you don't have that skill set, then partnering uh, with academics or industry partners who might have that skill set. Uh, Kathy, do you have any thoughts to add to that uh, question? Yeah, I have a lot of conversations, drink a lot of coffee with colleagues, uh, <laughs> not necessarily within the tourism discipline. I understand some of the tourism programs are pretty small, you may have two or three other colleagues, that's it. But talk to other people, talk to people from design, from engineering, you know, from health sciences. Um, over the coffee, very often you generate lots of great ideas. Uh, not necessarily research ideas, but points. And then you can think about how can I, for example, solve a particular issue or look at it from a different way. So I think brainstorming really help. Um, I, I, Personally, I don't function very well in a large brainstorming situation in, in a room of 20, 30 people. I'm usually the least creative among all of those. But if I talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one and talk about an interesting topic, then I my mind started to work. Huh, maybe I can do something like this or something like that. So everybody works differently, but I don't think anybody can say, I don't have any creative juice in me. Everybody has it. You just have to find it. Mm. Mariana, did you if want I to... made some yes, jump in, <laughs> I'm sure everybody has heard of stories of people, I mean, creative people saying, you know what, I conceived this idea while I was playing tennis, while I was swimming, when I was in the toilet. Well, these stories are not jokes from the point of view that you don't develop an idea by sitting down on a desk from eight to five o'clock, the idea comes between this time, you go home and you continue your life. Um, the idea can emerge at any stage. At, you might be brainstorming with colleagues and your mind might be somewhere else. So my suggestion will be try to have what I probably might call a variety of experience activities in your life. Not a boring life, a boring life from the point of view that you have a routine and you sit down and you study and then you meet with colleagues and then you do your homework and all that. Try to do things in your routine, even in a different way. This can exercise your brain. It can probably show you things from a different perspective. Yeah, For example, when you walk from office to home, don't go all the time the same route. Try a different route. Why not? You might see things. They might make you think differently, not in terms of research, of other things. And this will exercise your brain to think differently, quicker, in a different perspective. Um, thinking is just a brain exercise. And it doesn't happen by memorizing a book or knowing as many theories as you can. Um, you really need to exercise your body, your well being your routine, your life, and I think afterwards it will come naturally in some way. Thanks, Mariana. I, I think that whole holistic perspective on, you know, the fact that we are academics and, and we rely, of course, on our <laughs> minds so much, but, uh, you know, how um, holistically we, we, we nurture that um, process um, to encourage those uh, new ideas and new ways of thinking. I think that's a great point. Uh, there's a comment in the chat about methodologies, and I'll just pick up on this. Um, so potentially, uh, in your view as, as a panel, are there any um, methods that are more or less inclined to support um, original research? Uh, and I'm just thinking here, and not to preempt your conversation, but certainly as an associate editor myself, uh, the increasing use of um, SEM and uh, systematic literature reviews and often giving very, um, I think, quite um, superficial insights into topics, but um, it would be great to get your insights into that. Um, Sarah, can I get you to talk initially on that topic? Absolutely. So method is never independent of the research question. 
You don't innovate by selecting the method and then retroengineering the problem around, it, right? So you need to so you need to use the simplest possible methods, the simplest possible valid methods to answer your research question. And you know, I've, I'll tell you two fun stories, and then I'll come back to your question. I remember I published a segmentation study once, and I that's my field, right? Uh, so I know a little bit about segmentation. I published this study. The reviewers come back and tell me well, that's not very sophisticated. You should be using fast factor cluster analysis. Well, I hit the rule, right? Because I've published papers proving that factor cluster analysis is the worst thing you can do to a data set. So basically the reviewers object because my method was not sophisticated enough. That's terrible for knowledge development, right? We, we definitely do not wanna, wanna go there. So, so, and then I forgot the rest of your question, Leon, because I got too excited about my little story here. But basically, <laughs> basically it's it, method is, oh, the other story is I often get asked, Sarah, how do you get so trivial work published in leading journals? <laughs> and once I get over being offended by the comment, I realize that actually a lot of my papers do use quite simple methodology, right? And actually you will be interested to hear I work with one of the top applied uh, um, statisticians. Why? Because I'm pretty good at quant, but I'm not an expert. So I'd much rather work with an expert. And it's actually her, she pulls me back from the, from the complicated nonsense because she keeps me honest and says, no, 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 no. This is what we need to do to answer this question. End of story, right? My originality, my contribution, me changing the world through my research depends on me using appropriate methodology rather than parading the methodology around like a peacock uh, and putting it front, right, and center of the paper. I have no idea if it answers your question, Leone, but I had a great time answering anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy, can I get you to reflect on some of the methodologies that I, I may or may not promote, I think, original research, or in your view at least? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, method is a tool. And you, you need to figure out what you want to do, and then you get the tool, right? So um, that's just a, a natural way of thinking. Very often I ask my um, PhD student to give me a table, right? You have your questions first. What questions do you want to answer? How do you answer them, right? So every method you use should match up with a research question or objective you want to answer. Uh, so everything needs to be in that matrix. How do you do it? What do you, what tool do you use, and, and what question do you answer? So very often we see uh, papers submitted saying that I make methodology contribution. Fine, but uh, is that is that really innovative? Is, is is that really the right method? Very and now with a big data available, almost everywhere we see a lot of data driven uh, papers, but doesn't make any difference, right? Do I gain anything? Is the world better because you, you have analyzed, you know, big data sets. Um, and and that, another point about methodology is try to triangulate. Uh, a, a very uh, important issue that we have to deal with is, again, because of the limitation of traditional survey research, very often the work we do does not have external validity. Your finding is only based on this particular sample that you have. So with triangulation, especially if you can get not only data triangulation, but method triangulation, then uh, you can really enhance the external validity. In other words, the value of your research. Mm. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Sarah. I just wanted to add to Kathy, I totally agree. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, Kathy, one thing we don't see enough is Triangulation is great, but even better would be if we went crazy and did some real field experimentation. We don't see that much in tourism, right? So if you triangulate three poor methods, it still doesn't make a good study. But once we start getting really serious and really starting to measure behavior, to prove our ideas in the field, in the field that we wanna change, then stuff gets really exciting. So I totally, totally uh, concur to Kat with Kathy's comments here. Mm -hmm. Uh, apologies, there was an earlier comment and question from Emily. Uh, Sam, if you just want to ask that uh, on, on, on my behalf, or it's gone back up the chat, I can't seem to get to it anymore. <laughs> the question was, how do you see tourism and hospitality context role in making theoretical contributions to theories that developed in other disciplines? 
for example, work-life boundary theory when applied in Airbnb host is tested in an extreme context where work almost fully integrated with family. Mm -hmm. Mariana, did you want to lead off on that one? Um, well, when somebody tries to transfer a theory to a different context, the first thing that he or she would need to investigate is whether the theory is applicable fully or partially and why. So um, somebody would need to investigate what are the different dimensions or features of the context that differs from the context whereby the theory this has been applied and whether he or she can do it. Um, and of course, the tourism hospitality context has many different ways that it differs from many different industries. Yeah, so somebody can use the context to validate um, a new theory by adding a new variable, deleting a variable, adding a different perspective or saying the theory doesn't apply. Uh, this can be original in some way when you modify something. Um, of course, you don't reinvent the wheel, but you do something new, let's say. Uh, so yes, um, as I said before, replication studies are not bad. It's just that you really need to explain or justify what is the new and whether the new that you provide is significant new, or you just reconfirm what we know. Thanks, Mariana. I'm just conscious of time. We have about nine minutes uh, left and we've got lots of questions still coming in. Um, so I might wrap a couple of these up together into one big one. Uh, Loretta asked about how do we encourage early career Oh, sorry, early career research is to be more uh, more creative and to think more independently and outside of the box. Um, so that's one part of that question. Uh, but I think just encouraging, how can we encourage our ECRs to be more creative, uh, to produce more original uh, research in light of some of the uh, constraints that uh, Sarah talked about earlier, the fact that, you know, they need to publish, they need to publish very quickly. Uh, so how can we encourage our ECRs in this respect? So Kathy, do you want to lead us off on that question? I, I think early career researchers are, I mean, they're the future. I, I see them as being more creative than, than us. Um, Yes, we have the experience, we know the field, but coming up with great idea, I think, is the strength of early career researchers. They don't realize it. Sometimes they will say, oh, my professor asked me to come up with a new topic, therefore I go do the literature review. Like I said, don't let the literature frame your idea, right? You need to go outside of the literature. Mm -hmm. uh, when you find a very interesting phenomenon, I always go back to the phenomenon. Tourism is a phenomenon, right? Um, earlier, uh, Sarah raised the point about, about field experiment. Actually, all the psychology, most of the psychology studies are done in laboratory and tourism is the natural laboratory. And we can push further all the psychological theories actually uh, in the field of tourism, right? So I, I think uh, if we can just give PhD students and early career researchers confidence that yes, they can do it, and then we as supervisor or as senior colleagues can help with the implementation of their idea. That, that should be able to push them forward a little bit, I think. Just be confident. Yes. <laughs> Great message. If Thank I you. may. <laughs> Please, Mariana. Well-spoken, Kathy. Um, something to add as well. My first reaction to your question, uh, Leonie, would have been, well, give them less stress to publish. Uh, then I thought it again and I said, well, you know what? The reason why people sometimes try to publish, 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 publish is not only because they have the pressure to publish, but it's probably also because of what is being promoted as the good researcher. I think to some extent, some people, sometimes they get into the trap that unless if they publish and every day or every month, they declare on LinkedIn or Facebook that they have a new paper, 
they probably don't feel that they're productive or good researchers. So I don't think that they think I need to publish, publish, publish. It's only being pressured by our institutions. I think in, to a certain extent, we are also responsible for, you know, reiterating. So I think we also need internally to redefine what we call a good researcher or what are the metrics that we want ourselves to be benchmark against who is a good researcher. Is it the quantity or the quality? And do I really have to publish 50 papers uh, to feel productive or important, or I have just to produce one that is quality enough, original, or it does contribute something new rather than replicating others. Uh, so it has to come internally, I think, as well. Thanks, Mariana. Sarah, I think um, to lead off and finish that uh, question, can you add your thoughts? Yeah, so I think uh, I, uh, everything is, I agree with absolutely everything. Maybe the, a more personal note for us, not only as editors. Oh, uh, not a good time for vacuum cleaning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, just live coming in the way. Um, so, uh, you know, every day, that, now I'm not talking as an editor. I'm talking as a person who has uh, junior people here, postdocs and PhD students. And I find it incredibly difficult, right? Because every day of their lives, I have to say to them, you must pursue the things that, that, that inspire you. You must be curious. You must ask the questions you're passionate about. And then I have a brief pause and I say, but if you want an academic career, we're gonna have to simultaneously manage your publications because otherwise you're not gonna get a job. And it is heartbreaking to say that, absolutely heartbreaking, because I had the privilege to live, you know, to, to grow up as an early career researcher pondering the universe. It took me years to figure out I was supposed to publish. And I think that today's early career researchers are denied that really important stage of finding themselves as researchers, as scholars, of uh, figuring out what they're passionate about. Um, I had a, I'll give you one more story. I had a really fantastic junior colleague visit me from another country. I won't say too much because I don't wanna uh, 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 give too much away. But anyway, we wanted to collaborate and that person sat in my room and we were talking and my first question was, so what are you excited about, right? Because that's how I start my collaborations. I say, what are you excited about? Then I'm gonna tell you what I'm excited about and then we'll see if something overlaps. And that person just burst out into tears. And I said, goodness me, what did I say? How, how could that have possibly been offensive? And the person looked at me after doing a PhD and having probably two years of post PhD experience, looked at me and said, nobody has ever asked me that, right? And I just, I still get goosebumps because I'm in shock. So I think here it's actually not on the, on the journals. Here the journals are not causing the harm. Mm -hmm. Here it's on the universities, on the supervisors, on the colleagues, on the peers. We need to protect early career researchers. We need to secure them a little bubble of freedom where they can uh, pursue their dream. Because can you imagine how boring a 40 year university career is if all you're doing is, is trying to look for the next paper to publish, engineering a, an age index. That would just be disastrous. It wouldn't be an industry. It wouldn't be a trade I would wanna be part of, right? We've got to ensure people can maintain curiosity and enthusiasm about their work. Thanks, Sarah. I think that's an excellent point to end off on. Um, promoting curiosity, promoting confidence, um, feeling confident that you are making an original contribution, uh, potentially being very risk-taking in that process and acknowledging that the process might take a little bit longer than the traditional sausage factory type uh, or baseline original paper. Um, thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you to Professor Sarah Dolnica, uh, Professor Kathy Zhu, Professor Mariana Sagala. Uh, thank you, Sam, for supporting this session. Um, I will close off with a plug. I am uh, conference chair for Cauthy 2022 Hybrid Conference. Uh, for those of you who are in the session, we would definitely welcome your preliminary thoughts as a working paper. Uh, so that's another opportunity for you to progress some of those uh, 
original ideas um, in a very safe environment. So that's my plug. It's been a pleasure very much uh, today to um, speak with all of our panellists. And I agree, this is a fantastic topic. It's not something we can solve in one session, but I think for our colleagues who are with us online, please do take forward some of those ideas. Uh, be brave, uh, be confident. Uh, and I think that's a nice point to end on. So thank you to all of our speakers again, and for those in our audience, enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you. Thank you.